Beyond the lands of Mornstead, across reality's horizon, a god stirs in a realm of hell and ash against his shackles. This fallen god, stricken from the histories and mentioned only in feared whispers, once ruled as tyrant over humanity. He and his demonic retinue have not once but twice threatened the realm of mortals with desolation and sought desperately to return from their millennia-long exile. This is the story of Adir, the demon god, manipulative antagonist of the Lords of the Fallen Games. Is he truly as vile as his enemies believe? Or was he wrongfully accused, betrayed, and forced to languish for crimes he didn't commit? In this video, we'll plumb ancient texts to uncover his origins, the reality of his Rogar domain, as well as the beliefs of his followers and the powers at his disposal. A warning that major Lords of the Fallen spoilers are to come. Alright, let's dive in. Adir, a name of which mere mention strikes fear into the hearts of kings, stokes the passions of zeal within the hallowed sentinels and the lamentations of those within the divine church of Orion Radiance. Propaganda would have the masses believe that this god fallen is the great deceiver and tyrant. But as with many things, the truth runs far deeper and twists intricate knots. Gods and lords of the fallen, despite what their supplicants extol, are not truly altruistic. All vie for power and influence against one another and within the pantheon of gods. In fact, the opening lines of the 2023 game enlightens us to mortal plight, as nothing but pawns who attempt to weather the destructive and emotional vagaries of the divine. Gods are fickle, self-absorbed, and above all fear the loss of their station. Many deities are purported to exist amongst the heavens and in the depths of hell. The Putrid Mother, patron of Umbral and the enigmatic extinct Nahuta civilization, hungers for the warmth of all the living. The First of the Beasts stalks the snow-capped petrified forests of northernmost Uteranger. Menasilde is a peaceful goddess of the moon and protector of the far-off Walusia. Divine Aureus, master of light and life, the venerated figure within the hallowed sentinels and his monotheistic church. A deer, meanwhile, has been pulled from the gods' pantheon and long exiled for countless generations. The peoples of Mornstead and the Greater Oathlands both fear and despise him, believe him to be nothing more than a tormentor and crazed monarch under whose heel they were made to suffer for centuries. In his image, they project their own base desires. Hatred, greed, aggression, contempt. And so have grown to loathe him. To them, he is burning in the hellfire of his Rogar realm, surrounded by all manner of twisted abominations of his own creation, where he'll continue to languish for eternity. But this image of a fallen god that has gripped hearts and minds was not always a deer's to bear. He once was humanity's lord. He once was believed fair and kind ruler. To understand the transformation of his reputation, as well as the nature of his imprisonment, we must travel over 1,500 years into the past, before the rise of Mornstead, before the Hallowed Sentinels, to a time shrouded in obscurity and warped by legend. Thousands of years of lies. That's what the world's been fed. A deer was no tyrant. He was a shepherd to humanity. We couldn't be trusted. But he was there to guide us, to keep peace and order and justice. The creation myths of mortals espouse conflicting beliefs, and it can't be divined with certainty which god among the realities truly gave rise to mankind. But many in the ancient past were convinced that the true god, the one god, named Adir, created humanity. As his children, he protected them, watched over them, and guided them in a peaceful existence. At least that's what is recorded in the annals of his church. Conversely, others hold that in his infinite vanity and need for control, a deer spawned humanity desiring a people over which he could rule absolutely. Beings made only for prostration and satisfaction of his conceit. Nonetheless, a deer sits as god of human realms for untold centuries. 
His church teaches his dogma, and civilizations are indoctrinated in his worship. Over time, however, delusion infects the masses. Across kingdoms of men, there are those disabused by his rule, those disaffected souls that have been robbed of happiness, family, wealth, and hope, either by God's action or his inaction. The name a deer is tarnished as realization opens thousands to the idea that above them, in the intangible heavens, resides not a forgiving father, but a manipulative autocrat whose invisible chains bind them to servitude. Resentment simmers for years, then boils into outright bloodshed and hysteria as seething multitudes within man's realms gather the courage, the conviction, and the strength to cast off their chains and confront their oppressive overlord. The word of rebellion spreads as humanity declares war on a god and engages a deer in hopes of overthrowing the despot. Cries and arms gather behind the banner of the three judges, legendary demigods whose resolute conviction inspires all. And judge cleric, warrior, and assassin draw swords in defiance. As this ancient tome goes on to detail, so it came that after ages of slavery, three proud men defied a deer, our god. They gave us a new sense of right and wrong. They told us how to live freely. Hence, people called them the judges. In course, cathedrals are burned, divine statues are raised, priests and pilgrims are slaughtered, as all aspects of a deer are ruthlessly purged from human culture. No longer a god, but a demon born from hell, the judges and their armies curse a deer's name. Until the fucking judges. They were no heroes. Just greedy heretics who turn people against their god. But the stories say different, don't they? <clears throat> the rebellion against the deer disquieted the souls of thousands and drove them to existential dread. How could one hope to go against God and succeed? And if one did succeed and God was discovered not to be inviolable, but rather tangible and mortal, what would be a world without him? Faith would shatter, reality rendered suspect, all sense of morality and ethics subject to human ambition. Simply, they would be a flock without a shepherd. Naturally, this kept many on the accursed tyrant's side, defenders of the only faith they knew in a world that without it would be insufferable. During the uprising against the deer, there are many records of priests exhorting God's munificence, of condemning the rebels, and demanding all perform penance. The God's domain shall not be touched. This has been known for eons. How could they start a rebellion against a deer? Before this fire could be extinguished, it spread. It became an uprising against God, the ultimate sin. If they lay down their arms, they might avoid God's wrath, and his wrath is great, as great as the resources at his disposal. To combat the rebellion, a deer retreats momentarily to the realm of Rogar. Several realms, planes, realities, exist in Lords of the Fallen, and most float listlessly and forever beyond one another's reach. But for all powerful divine beings, the chasm between realms is passable through great effort. The Rogar realm is a land of violence and desolation, a place of eternal fire that burns the very soul and stokes the dark desires held within each heart. It's a land where greed, hatred, and vice are made manifest, amplified by the flames that torch the skies. The only image we see of this hellscape comes in the final confrontation against a deer, a land cast in the reds and purples of heat. It's uncertain whether a deer is a native of Rogar, the creator of it, or merely the realm's future prisoner, but none can deny his mastery of its power. Rogar is the source of inferno magic, sorceries that imitate the combustion and destruction of the plane from which they are empowered. A deer weaves the realm's malevolent energies into physical form, thus creating the first Rogar lords. The appearance of God's lords and legions of Rogar warriors bolsters the resolve of those who remain faithful. It strikes awesome fear in the hearts of heretics. 
God's wrath is at hand. Swords are locked, and bloody war consumes the mortal realm. Recollections from witnesses on both sides of the conflict lend their voice to events. A member of the rebellion recounts that the lords were sent upon the humans to crush the rebellion. There were no more believers or unbelievers. There was only death. This contradicts the sentiment heard in words of one still pledged to a deer. So it came that the lords walked the earth, sent for by a deer himself. They were not greeted in humility, but fought by heretics. The most beautiful creatures of our God were attacked, even slain. Regardless of camp, what transpires on the plain of battle is forever etched in lore. Adir's lords were vanquished, the forces of rebellion were ascendant, and the three judges banished the fallen god, exiling him to languish eternally in the Rogar realm. Elation roils through the ranks. Humanity achieved the impossible and liberates themselves from the greatest tyranny. A first-hand account of those days records that the Rogar are gone and the god is no more. A new era has begun, the time of the judges. We'll build new temples to honor the judges that have freed this world. It's a moment of joy. But this is merely one perspective from events of ages past, and history is not the provenance of truth. Rather, it's written by the victors in the blood of the vanquished. Cast in a different light, an Adir's tale is that of a god betrayed by his creation, who stays his retribution for fear that his wrath will destroy them entirely. Like adolescents testing the limits of a newly realized autonomy, humankind struggles against its father's prohibitions. They see a tyrant rather than a loving parent whose admonitions stand only to protect they believe themselves visionary, free to enact their will, though this and their very souls were formed from their creator's largesse. Adir saw the revolutionary counterculture as a seed of discord that would rend his children and turn them against him. The Rogar invasion, a vain attempt to spare devoted followers from the zealous flames of a heretical new religion. Adir's anguish at the loss of his followers could be inferred from his moniker, the bereft exile. The fallen god is deprived of something. He is lacking someone in painful isolation impossible to endure. It might be that he is bereft of his children whom he loved, but more so than that, he is denied his home. This sentiment we hear in the lore of his boss remembrance. Ultimately, even more so than his desire for vengeance upon those who had wronged him, a deer wanted one simple thing, to go home. This is a staggering realization, one that implies a deer is not an infernal demon spawned of the Rogar realm, but the rightful god and deity of the mortal realm from which he was banished. In confrontation with him in his exile, a deer reveals his truth and the pain suffered from the three judges. To open your eyes to their manipulations, to millennia of shameful distortions of the truth. For eons, I stood as mankind's guardian, shepherding them with wisdom and love. Yet in return, I was betrayed. Those three power hungry malefactors who declared themselves judges turned my own children against me. Whose truth are we to believe? The word of an old god, fallen and silenced, or of a new religion tied to the dogma of its church? This is only one of many grave questions posed to the lampbearer in their journey across Mornstead's broken land. Regardless of the truth of Adir's reign and subsequent banishment, None can deny the ferocity embodied by the fallen gods Rogar. Rogar are the twisted mirror of human emotion. They embody pain, loathing, scorn, and malice, amplified by the nature of their fiery realm. As the charred Lord Armatinct elaborates, Rogar are born in fire, their bodies tempered by a deer's inferno, the intensity of which would reduce any typical human body to ash. Rogar are completely obedient to Adir, 
they're extensions of his will and have none of their own. Three times has a deer sent his Rogar to the mortal realm, once to quell rebellion and twice to instigate his return. Their animosity, their enmity towards humanity, and their gruesome visage have only grown with each summons. Rogar appear in myriad horrifying shapes meant to spread fear and symbolize their warped corruption. Of those faced in Mornstead, there are two categories, Rogar natives and Rogar transformed by exposure to a deer's corrupting influence. Rogar natives are distinct in appearance. Spiked plates and dark armor weave painfully into the flesh of these monsters and evoke strong emotions of disgust and terror. Most present with bony skullcaps that completely cover the face where eyes might be, while large teeth and open jaws create a truly appalling front. Rogar hounds and the serpentine trapper are lithe and cunning. They strike with swift, overwhelming force before retreating to the shadows. It's said that trappers are among the most cunning and patient of Rogar, and as the trapper crossbow lore recounts, like other sightless Rogar, trappers more than compensate for their lack of vision with an unnatural and fearsomely keen extrasensory perception, which makes them even more lethal as warriors, and from which no prey can seemingly hide. Hounds often accompany the trappers and spray hot flames of magma from open jaws. Ruiners and skin stealers represent the brute force and surgical lethality of Rogar forces. The Ruiner stands as an indomitable lieutenant, guiding lesser beasts to Adir's whims. These infernal demons wield great axes and shields charged with inferno magic. The hidden lore of their accoutrements enlightens us to their adept skill. Ruiners serve as the calamitous hammer of Adir's forces second only to the Rogar giants in terms of physical power. Although unlike those simple-minded behemoths, Ruiners possess a cruel intelligence and an adeptness for war. The giants mentioned are great Rogar monstrosities such as the spurned progeny boss. The remains of other giants can be seen bubbling in pools of magma blood as they lie slain in the aftermath of an assault on Skyrest Bridge, repelled by the hallowed sentinels. Skin stealers, meanwhile, prowl abandoned towns and dark alleys, hunting those few left in Mornstead that oppose them. These Rogar have gained their name due to their predilection for scalping and harvesting the flesh of their victims as trophies, prizes won in the hunt. This barbaric practice engenders terror within the ranks of Mornstead military and hallowed sentinel alike. More horrendous than these, however, are the graces of a deer. Though not seen firsthand in Mornstead, the gruesome slaughter piled atop the feast hall in Bramus Castle could be inferred to be the work of the Graces, as their armor set is found close by. These demons are elegant in the eyes of their creator, their razor-sharp appendages flay with savage quickness. The Graces are cherished by a deer and seldom roam beyond his domain, as we hear in the hidden lore of their armor. A deer finds only beauty in the dexterous and elegant dancing of his graces, a type of rogar rarely seen outside their realm of origin. But the most cunning of all rogar, especially to the lamp bearer, is the light reaper. This tireless demon is an unholy mixture of rogar energies and an umbral parasite, endowed with the purpose of extinguishing all umbral lamps that might prevent a deer's return. The Light Reaper is loathed by its master, who looks upon it with suspicion, as a deer doesn't wholly trust the umbral magic flowing through his body. The inferno wielding conflagrant seers and infernal enchantresses demonstrate the searing power found in worship of a deer. They command fire and flame, they immolate cities and rend flesh to dust. Inferno magic is a tempestuous force easily capable of consuming the ill-prepared, and the conflagrant seers, guided by visions of flame and crystal, are unmatched in their mastery over its power. The seers are also responsible for the proliferation of Rogar crystal seen throughout Bramus Castle. 
This terraforming creates an environment more akin to their native Rogar, and strengthens all demons who lurk within. The Enchantress burns with sadistic glee, the screams of the immolated, a symphony she cherishes. Though armed with spiked flails, they are best from a distance where they unleash salvos of scorching heat. The lore of Infernal Enchantress flesh enlightens us to the strength and preservation found within all Rogar as a blessing and connection to their fallen god. While not gods themselves, the Rogar are born of a deer's will and thus carry his divine presence within them, even if only a minuscule fragment. Apart from Rogar natives are those who have been corrupted in body and soul by a deer's influence. Through the rune of a deer, the fallen god has maintained strength in the mortal realm, and this artifact, charged with his immense power, is a source of plague and mind-shattering malignancy that not only stains the beacons of the hallowed sentinels, but also the very essence of those mortal beings within Mornstead. Mornstead's devastation, the butchery and horror, all the doing of them and their infernal master, so much pain and death. The corrupted are present throughout the broken kingdom and lash out in crazed frenzy. We hear in the disgorged viscera armor that the Rogar sickness warps the infected both inside and out, transforming them into a horrendous mockery of their former selves. In regards to humans, perhaps a deer considers this a just unveiling of the corruption inherent in all of mankind. It's God's reward for apostasy. The corruption terrifies as the sentinels know not its cause or its spread. It claims victims from all levels of society and all levels of holiness. Pilgrims and penitents are transfigured. We see too in the raw manglers, warriors that have succumbed entirely to a deer's influence. Their bodily mutations highlight a festering inner pain, while at the same time disquieting those who would face them. Perhaps the most fearsome of a deer's mutilated converts is the proselyte, an unhallowed husk of what once was a hallowed sentinel crimson rector. After capture, they suffer unyielding torture, symbolized by the countless nails hammered into their flesh, until their spirit breaks and their mind fractures. They are then vulnerable to a deer's privations. They cast off their holy vows and are proselytized in the way of the fallen god. This terrible transformation echoed in the hidden lore of their sword. Those hallowed sentinels unfortunate enough to be taken for proselytization always pray to the cleric after their torment begins. But as those prayers go unanswered and the hellish agony continues without end, inevitably their shattered minds and ruined bodies embrace the glory of their one true god, a deer. Apart from the Rogar forces of invasion that prowl a now desolate kingdom, there are humans who have for generations found strength and purpose within the cult of Adir. This cult is the secret remnant of the fallen god's religion. For millennia, worshippers of Adir scattered across the world have practiced their faith in the shadows to avoid persecution, patiently awaiting the triumphant return of the Red Shepherd. Though he was defeated and exiled, Many loyal adherents continued to venerate Adir, to follow his religion, and to pray for his return. As the prime scriptures of their religion state, the butchery carried out against the faithful by the judges and their followers brings pain to the heart of any disciple of Adir. But the truth must never be forgotten, and with that pain comes strength. The truth they endure is that Adir is a benevolent god that he saved humans from their own vices. Without a guide, humanity has fallen to base pleasure and become victim to fate's whim. The scriptures continue. Since the betrayal of a deer, humanity has committed countless atrocities against itself. Only his divine guidance can restore order to the world. They don't just work to orchestrate a deer's return. His disciples actively impress his vision upon the world. 
Pain is central to a deer's dogma. In pain, there is strength, and pain is the language known best to a deer's disciples. Often they self-mutilate to demonstrate their conviction, most commonly a hand in allusion to the Hand of God mountain range, where some believe the dormant God yet lies. This stigma highlights the sacrifice of Damaros the Marked. Divine Adir, witness this offering I make to you. They believe pain leads to clarity of mind and purity of soul. It brings them closer to their god, suggested in the sufferer armor tinct. More often, however, they gleefully inflict pain on enemies. A deer worshippers maim and slaughter, butcher and mutilate in service to their god. Great envy dwells in their hearts for their Rogar companions. Many people throughout history have worshipped a deer and by extension the Rogar admiring their power and at times envying their closeness to a deer, the Rogar being pure creations born directly from the god himself. Worshippers commonly follow the gruesome practices of Rogar demons, taking flesh as prize and even going so far as self-immolation to mirror the flames of the Rogar and prove their devotion. Much can be learned of Adir's religion from the catalogue of sorceries and magic at his worshippers' disposal. As the god of chaos in the infernal Rogar realm, Adir is patron deity of inferno sorcery, which draws upon the flame of the individual and the molten magma of the earth to melt opposition. Inferno magic is raw, untamed, and in the hands of the unskilled can quickly lead to their own death, which we see in the hidden lore of Flame Funnel. This spellcraft is largely divided into two categories, those that fan the inner zeal of the devoted and those that call forth great firestorms. With shouting magic, the user channels the strength of God through his word. They invoke Adir's name to stoke their passion and greatly augment their body. In Adir's hardiness and endurance, we see the effect is to increase defense and regeneration against enemy attacks. Others, like Adir's vengeance, are curses and incantations to wither foes with words alone. The inferno magic of fire is used to channel Adir's gift in destructive ways and also to call upon the earth's magmatic bowels as fuel for burning salvos. Many are the inferno sorceries that cast fireballs, summon fell beasts of flame, and singe the very air. Others, like the Magma Surge and Seismic Slam, draw on the molten core beneath the earth to inundate the land in hot, swift flows of magma. The hidden lore of the latter enlightens us to the mage beliefs. Many a dear worshippers take heart upon hearing of any large-scale seismic activity, for they consider such to be aftershocks of a deer hammering upon the barrier which keeps him from his rightful home, a barrier which will one day fall. In keeping with the symbolism of their religion, many of the catalysts used by inferno sorcerers are severed hands, claws, or other various appendages taken either from fallen foes or from their own body in service to their lord. Worshippers see in inferno magic the blessing of God and brief flashes of his true power, a reverent and dangerous reminder of in whom they should place their faith. As the prime scriptures go on to tell us, Power is only as solid as the faith upon which it's built. There is the force behind the strike, the spark behind the inferno, but before all of that, there is the devotion behind the disciple. This was it. The moment I handed over the rune of a deer and damned this entire kingdom for generations to come. The lamp bearer's quest leads to the sundered kingdom of Mornstead ruined by Adir's corruption and concomitant Rogar invasion. Though Judge Cleric and the Hallowed Sentinels stood vigil over their five holy beacons that had acted as chains to bind Adir in prison, even they were without the strength to oppose the fallen god forever. From internal corruption and external conquest, 
the lands of Mornstead crumble in flames and flow with blood. But despite its outward appearance as a bastion of the hallowed sentinels, a beacon of radiant light, the lands of Mornstead were not always aligned with the god Aureus. In fact, they might have been the last holdout of a deer's faithful those many centuries ago. From its proximity to the Hand of God Mountains and its connection to the civilizations of old that appeared in the First Lords of the Fallen game that centered on events surrounding the First Rogar invasion roughly 1,000 years ago, we know that Mornstead's environs are steeped in Adir's holiness and filled with those who would follow his word. As the lore of the incinerating blast states, the hand of Adir has always been a site of significance to worshippers of the banished god. Pilgrims the world over likely flocked to the valley of the hand in reverent devotion. We know too from texts and inferences that the kingdom of Mornstead arose from the bones of this civilization that came before and lies either on top of or close to its crumbled remains. Of significance was the Keystone Monastery, location of dark rituals, cruel experiments, and a target of Rogar attacks during the first invasion. It echoes with the lingering whispers of a deer's power that the faithful seek to preserve. From the lore of justice and infernal guardian, we learn that the cleric located and took possession of a number of items from the event, intending to learn what she could from them. But before the authorities were able to completely close off Keystone Monastery, some expeditious Adir worshippers were able to retrieve Rogar equipment and magical knowledge left behind. Supporting the theory that the valley shadowed by the Hand of God Mountains was a bulwark of the Fallen God's religion and bastion for his adherents comes to us in the opening cinematic of the game. I'd like to give a big shout out to some guy whose comments and great research into this topic helped enlighten me and inspire further scrutiny. This scene shows the sentinels coming to Mornstead, not the judge's victory over a deer, as the fallen god mountains came about centuries following his banishment. Cleric and the sentinels besiege the last fortress of the exiled god. They scatter his remaining forces. As the knight of a deer armor extols, the many men and women who fought, killed and died in service of their god Adir, as his knights, did so proudly, and the loyalty they willingly offered him pleased him. With resolute conviction, Cleric erects the beacons of the sentinels to reinforce his prison, then invests herself within Mornstead as eternal custodian of her holy charge. But as the centuries march, the Cleric's vigil weakens. The rune of a deer, left behind in the god's failed return millennia ago, is in the possession of Harkin, the Iron Wayfarer. He journeys to Mornstead and seeks an audience with the cleric. The rune is too much for him to bear, but neither can he destroy it. Instead, Harkin entrusts its fate to Judge Cleric and the Hallowed Sentinels, seen in this stigma. Little do all present know that though a deer slumbers in the Rogar realm, his rune pulses with chaotic energies and works to spread the fallen god's malevolent aura. The rune of a deer remains under watchful eye of the sentinels for centuries. All the while, it corrodes mind, body, and land as the source of the Rogar corruption. Its power works insidiously. Many are unaware of its influence. Over time, the great kingdom of Mornstead suffers silent infiltration by worshippers of the bereft exile. Calrath City's aristocracy and even the nobility of Bramus Castle follow under a deer's thrall as converts meet in shadows to orchestrate the destruction of the sentinel's beacons and return of their fallen god. Queen Sophisha is among those drawn to a deer's power and subdued by the promise of desire fulfilled in exchange for servitude. As madness from Rogar corruption sweeps the kingdom, dark deeds are performed to stain the radiant magic sustaining the beacons. Thus weakened, the ill-prepared kingdom of Mornstead is swept in carnage as the Lords of the Fallen return in a third Rogar invasion. The collapse of the beacons allows Adir's corruption to swell tenfold and burst upon the land, 
suffusing all with his chaotic energies and instantly transforming thousands into Rogar abominations. They join forces with the demons that pour forth from portals to the Rogar realm, and with the Adir worshippers that emerge from shadow. Mornstead and the hallowed sentinels who have fallen to depravity cannot stave Adir's malevolent tide. The flesh terror armor tinct enlightens us to the kingdom's gruesome fate. Some of those terrified survivors, fortunate enough to escape Kalrath following the Rogar invasion, carried with them grisly tales of Rogar not only maiming and killing with their barbarous weapons, but in subcases, tearing chunks of flesh from victims with their own claws. Bramis Castle, the symbolic crown of human achievement and humanity's power, is where the spiteful god chooses to make his return. He seeks vengeance against the mortals that wronged him, and highlights the futility of standing against him. But Adir's fate is far from certain, and whether the mortal realm sees a return of the exiled god is left entirely to the actions of the Lamp Bearer. They brand me evil, a tyrant, and yet I offer you something they will not. A choice. Two different endings to Adir's tale are possible. If the lamp bearer, in their journey, listens to the word of God, follows Adir as one of his disciples, and determines that his truth is the irrefutable verity of the past, they will lay bare the path for his return. The beacons of the sentinels remain uncleansed, the rune of Adir is further charged with godly power, and the lamp bearer uses the artifact to enter the defeated Judge Cleric's mind. Adir has long thought of his return and of the punishment owed to those that bound him. For Judge Cleric, he holds only loathing. He knows she doesn't fear death, but loss of freedom. The ultimate torture is to be made a prisoner and have her life's purpose stripped from her, precisely the punishment Adir exacts. With the rune, Judge Cleric's soul is banished and her body is possessed by the enemy humiliated and tarnished forever. A deer commands her physical form and bids the lamp bearer rise as first among his new Rogar lords. With God's return, it's unclear what the future holds for the mortal realm and how a deer will seek to redress the grievances of his 1500 year exile. If, however, the lamp bearer pursues the mission of either Aureus or the putrid mother, a deer is defeated. In both, he is consumed by the rapacious and unstoppable power of Umbral. One sees the lamp disintegrate his essence in the Rogar realm. The other sees the coming of the putrid mother into Axiom, in which case all beings, life and light, are drawn into her abyssal maws and suffer cold oblivion. For even a deer's roaring flames are snuffed by the chill of Umbral. So ends the tale of a deer. A god who, depending on perspective, was wrongfully accused and cast into prison by the vainglorious hands of those he once protected. Or a greedy lord, an oppressive god, whose tyranny his subjects could bear no more and so took up arms against him. Regardless of the truths professed from either camp, one thing is certain. A deer is possessed of supreme power and his menacing armies of Rogar demons are truly legion. With lies, with false promises, he manipulates mortals to enact his will. With assiduous care, he nearly returned from banishment centuries ago, and if the Rogar ending is decided upon by the Lamp Bearer, a deer returns again in all his splendor to rule over humanity with the first among his Rogar lords at his side. Thanks so much for watching and listening to this video on a deer, the once god of humanity and his Rogar realm. Let me know which side of history you believe, a misunderstood benevolent lord or an ambitious and bloodthirsty tyrant, as well as your own insights and suggestions for future videos in the comments below. And if you're a fan of lore and storytelling, be sure to subscribe to the channel, check out the podcast where content is uploaded frequently. I want to thank my amazing supporters over on Patreon who make all of this possible and I couldn't do it without their fantastic support. If you'd like to become a lore luminary for access to me, a great community, written scripts, and early video drops, head to patreon.com slash the lorebrarians to learn more. Until next time, go forth and explore the lore.